Hello, hello, hello. Hey, Hi. we did it. We're on. How are you? Yeah, I'm well. Can, um, you, see, can you see me okay? I can indeed. Yeah, it's very yeah. clear. I'm very low down, so I'll probably have to raise. I was going to say, at the moment, you're sort of like this. Okay, I've got a raised chair now. Okay, yeah, so good. Up. So good evening. How are you? Oh, yes. You've got hearts already popping up on the screen, Trevor. Oh, right. That's always okay. a good start. Good. That's great. And I, I have no idea what it means, but that's fantastic. It's love. You're getting love from your audience. Okay, I'm getting love. Spoken. Okay, I'll see, if, I'll see how that works out as the night <laughs> <laughs> that mellifluous how many voice. people I can offend? <laughs> so, um, so we're good to go, and I'm. Uh, I've got. Uh, we've talked somewhat over the last few we, years, and we've, yeah. we uh, we have a good sort of. We've got the kettle on a sort of rolling boil, and we'll be able to sort of just pick up, I guess. Um, we have. So I was going to introduce you first, Trevor. So obviously, I'm, we do these regularly. So people that join these sessions with us regularly, we do them fairly regularly. At least we used to do them a lot more than once a month, but at the moment they're about once a month. And what the big draw likes to do is to bring in special, sparkly, interesting people like Trevor huh. from across different disciplines to talk about drawing, oh. visual literacy, visual communication, mark making with meaning, people who are as passionate as the team are at the big draw. So this is sort of why why we're here today with, with Trevor. But Trevor, do you want to introduce yourself? Because I, when I was looking at your website and things, I said, how do I introduce you? You've got so many different hats. Well, um, I, mean, you, I know it would could, be good. To well, I, I'm, I'm always interested to hear how other people describe me. So that's that's the that's the well, fun bit. So to, I, mean, um, I know that like you're to... very much from an engineering background, and we're going to dip into that. But obviously, we're going to be really focusing on the power of, of drawing and, and visual communication, and really the idea of use of draw, using drawing, sketching, mark making. Um, to communicate ideas and thinking and how I mean not just not just engineers and architects but I know that you do work with lots of, of those types of organizations but how everybody can use mark making sketching drawing to help hone their thinking help formulate ideas and actually help them make make sense of, of, the, of the world around them but also maybe help them work through the development of their own thinking and ideas um, I mean I, sure. I for one I mean everyone that knows me knows I am never without my own notebook, sketchbook, pencil, and in a meeting or a conversation, I, I just can't stop myself. I am constantly scribbling, and I'm doodling, and I'm making little scribbles, and the scribbles mean something. They're a memory of something that we had in the conversation. It's a visual, yeah. it's like a visual totem of remembering that moment in time, that imprint, and I can come back to it, and I can remember it, and it's so powerful. And I know we're going to be yeah. talking a little bit about some of these things today, getting into some of the philosophy of of drawing yeah, yeah. and making and what that's that true. means as well yeah but in terms of just where we started so how would i well i mean how would i describe you i mean i i've been with a big draw for I'm coming over nine years now and uh, people have always spoken about trevor and sort of revered it's trevor from the drawing team <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it's true though it's true oh. i mean you've been doing it for a while and you're really at the vanguard of um setting up the organization and looking at the the power of drawing and see how it was used in different disciplines and and really pushing back from this idea that that drawing has to just be about aesthetically pretty pictures and i'm not i'm not yeah. dissing that it's lovely so i i love going to exhibitions and art galleries but that there's this huge other role and that what we find for everyone who works in the sort of drawing arena for want of a better a better word is that we all are having to constantly contextualize that to whoever we're talking yeah. to um, and That's I think it. one has to do it all the time. If it, if it's somebody outside of the sector or, you know, your general public or mummy or a daddy, one of my children's uh, parents' friends, and you say, oh, I work for the... They're like, oh, that's nice. So is it lots of lovely drawings and pictures? And you're like, it is lovely and it can be pictures. But then you have to go into a big spiel, don't you, about what you mean and what you're talking about. And it's always a bit frustrating, but it's also, it just shows you that it's actually a lot more complex than, than that. And actually what you're really talking about is visual literacy, visual communication, the marks of meaning. And then when you explain it to people, you can see their eyes sort of light up. They're like, oh, yeah, wow, OK. So it's across. It's like how it's used across everything. You're like, yes. Yeah. And so I think people then then get it. But often it does need some some context. But I mean, you've been doing all of this for a long time. And I know there's different aspects to your to, the, to your program. And obviously the drawing gym is one bit of that. But there's lots of other bits that you do. 
But I mean, I sure. suppose I would, I would call you a thinker, a polymath. I believe you have an engineering background, Trevor. Um, but tell us a little bit of background about, about yourself and then how you ended up setting up the drawing gym. What, what was the need for you that made you think, I? because I know it's a passion for you, it really is. Okay, so um, first of all, I just want to scotch that rumor that I have an engineering background. I, I don't. Uh, yeah. I work with... I work with some of the smartest engineers on the planet, and, but I don't have a background. I, what I do have is an uh, engineering drawing background, because when I was at school, um, my school, I grew up in the Northeast, and it was very heavily industrial, and it was going to be, I was always going to be going into some aspect of industry. So the school made a decision on my uh, behalf that I should drop art, because that's utterly pointless and I should do um, I should do you know engineering drawing instead it was either art or engineering drawing and then um, and so be it so I so I didn't I stopped doing art and um, even even though I'd been drawing since I was sort of eight or nine and I continued to draw and, and always had notebooks and stuff with drawings in it anyway cut to the case it's one of those stories where my old art teacher saw me in the town one day and he said, uh, I remember you, you used, to, you used to like drawing. And I said, yeah. And he, so, so it was a sort of case of this, this, this school teacher out of school, seeing me in the town and inviting me to join his adult ed group to do some light drawing. This is when I would have been maybe 14 or 15. So, so I did. And there were these gorgeous girls there. And, uh, and I... I I'd never seen, I obviously I'd never seen a life model before and I was 15 and I thought this is, um, this is a kind of heaven that I've landed in and there are gorgeous girls and my teacher's talking to me like he's never talked to me before. He's talking to me like, because I was, I was so bored at school. Uh, anyway, so, so there we went and then he said to me, you should, um, you should stay on at school because I was telling him I was going to leave school. He said you should stay, and so then I went on to do art, art A levels, and then I went to art school. So that's that's kind of my background, and I did fine art. So that, uh, intervention, I, that random intervention by that teacher was yeah. a bit of a sliding doors moment, really, for you. Com completely, yeah. and all and of the random, it wasn't even at school; it was just you bumped into him. Yeah, it yeah. was serendipity, so and. You know, those, that fantastic series that Ian Wright did, The Footballer, where he just mentioned this one mentor in his life that changed his life. Well, it absolutely was Mr. Boyle that changed my life. So I've just, like I've just... Everyone through, yeah, that's like a retrieved memory. I didn't save this up knowing that there was going to be some school teachers yeah, watching. Yeah. I mean, hi, Stefan's joined from Milan. Oh, so, well, hello, Stefan, Stefan. Hey. I saw Leonard as well. Leonard uh -huh. Shapiro is on the call. Very interesting gentleman. He'll probably have some questions later for you. Good. Um... So, so that thing about a, a, an intervention was incredibly important for me because it set me off on a path that, um, w you know, was, was clearly uh, massive, a massive change. Yeah. So in terms of the trajectory from art school to now, um, I did fine art. I was a practicing artist for uh, 16 years. I exhibited paintings, and, but drawing was always my thing. Yeah. And um, I started teaching, so I started teaching at St. Martin's and um, various other uh, art schools. And, and then I start, my teaching started to shift from kind of teaching, from teaching in the fashion department or teaching in the graphics department or in the art department. I would go and teach, you know, wherever somebody needed some teachers, that's what I was sort of doing. I, I was really into this because every time you'd have to do a bit of research and you had to change the underlying pedagogy of the lessons because they were going to be for different outcomes. Obviously, yes. you're not going to work in a, in, a, in a bunch full of fashion students and teach them what the industrial design guys need to know. You know? So, so it struck me that drawing was a movable feast and it was also... Um, you know, I was, somebody was paying me for doing something that I absolutely loved. You know? So... That's always been kind of the thing is that if you do if you do something that you love and somebody pays you for it, man, that's just how great is that. So so when I um when I set up drawing at work, it was eighteen years ago that I set up drawing at work and my first clients were advertising agencies and um and uh 
architect. And so, and when the architect said, can we do some drawing? I said, yes. Yeah. So I went over to see them and, um, and they said, we want to do some perspective drawing and we want to do it. And they just told me all these things that I couldn't possibly teach them. So I said to them, you know what you should be doing? You should be doing some life drawing. So they all went, whoa. So then, so then I said, okay, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll make a little circle. We'll, we'll, I'll bring in some dust sheets. We'll, we'll section off a bit of the studio and I'll bring models in. And so, so we started teaching life drawing to, um, to architects and, um, a certain prestigious architectural journal got hold of this story and made a mockery of it and basically said, you know, these, yeah. these guys were... So, uh, note, yeah. to self, note, note to self about this prestigious um, magazine saying bad things about my classes. And, and then in, in two years' time, when they came back to me and said, um, can we do a feature on you? I just said to them, no, I don't think so. Nobody reads magazines anymore, don't they? Don't they just go online and find stuff out with this? And they said, well, well, yeah, this magazine has a big readership. And I said, well, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. But what you could do is send a film crew because I'm doing a, I'm doing a live drawing event. And they, so they said, fine. So they filmed three of my teaching events. Um, and that was the beginning, really, of the drawing gym, of seeing that you could teach through film. Yeah. So, um, and that was also the birth of Sketchmob because Sketchmob came about as a result of the world global recession, which brought everybody, you know, brought everybody to their knees financially, except those, except those that it didn't, the super rich that managed to ride most recessions out. But yeah, that um, and so, so that's that's how Sketchmob was formed. Was once again because these guys were my, these guys were really close to me. These are people that I drew with every week uh, in, in their offices. And I said, basically, I don't want to lose touch with you guys. I don't want to. So I said, give me your, give me your um, personal email addresses so that you, and I'm going to run some free drawing workshops because you, because that's what, you know, what we're going to do. So, so it wasn't like COVID where you were walking around as a, as a potential lethal person that you couldn't be in the same room with somebody else. It was much more, it was much more sad and sorrowful and everybody was really scared because they, everybody was suddenly out of a job. I mean, one firm that I worked with fired 300 people in a week and I was walking around in a bloody daze because these were my, these were my guys. These were the guys that I drew with on a regular basis. So, so that's when we founded Sketchmob. I said, show up at St. Bart's Church in Clerkenwell um, in, um, in, in, in Smithfield, and um, we're going to draw, and we're going to have a film crew there. So, so it was amazing. We just got all these guys together, and, it, and the interior of Great St. Bart's, I don't know if you've been in there, but it is a magnificent. Uh, there is a lovely space. And that's, that was the first Sketchmob, and it was filmed. And um, so that's how Sketchmob got started. And, and so it's, it's been, it's usually been a shape-shifting experience from, you know, from one thing to the next to the next. And it's been seamless because what I've tended to do is just go slightly outside of the normal shape of things for the, yeah. for the company and for me. And then once you do it and you get, once you get it and you, and you get it into your r repertoire, then it, it, it looks like it's always existed there in that form. And, and so, it it, isn't it? If you can make it look like it's always, it's just yeah. so natural that they all, they all want it. You have one and then the rest, all the other people, they all want it. Their peer group all wants it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what happened with the life drawing. Yeah. Because we were working with, um, with make architects and some of the guys there taught at the Bartlett. Yeah. And the guys that they taught with, you know, were in big architectural firms. So within... Within six weeks, basically, we had Richard Rogers Architects as clients, and they wanted three courses a week because everybody in the building wanted to do the life drawing thing. Mm. So then it went mental. I mean, we had um, we had KPF, we had Allies and Morrison. I mean, I mean, really big, in big incredible big firm. Brands, yeah. I didn't, know, I didn't know diddly about architecture at the time. I mean, I. So what happened then was over the space of about three or four years was this fantastic reciprocal relationship because I could draw, I could go outside and draw anything 
but I didn't understand anything at all about engineering or architecture because I didn't, I didn't understand because I, why, why would I? So then there began to have, there began to be this kind of osmosis. So we would quite often go out for a beer after the classes and I, and I'd say, how do you draw this? And, you know, and they'd say, well, how do we, how should we be drawing this? And so, um, you know, the whole thing about drawing is, it is, it's a magnificent language. And it doesn't matter where you start, as soon as you're into the drawing domain, it can go, it's like a Ouija board or something. It can just go off in any direction. And if you, if you have a thorough knowledge of drawing, and, I, and I, I say by default, I have a very, very big knowledge of drawing, then I just love it. I just, I just love it. I mean, I just do it for the crack. You know, let, what, what happens if we do this? Or what happens if we take, what, if we, what happens if we take those kinds of principles and move them 25 degrees over and try them with a different skill set or try them with a different discipline or something, you know? That's why the engineers and architects that we work with love it. Cause it's, it's, it's about, it's about, when I show up for a class, it's about, 75 percent safe but i leave that area of jeopardy of to keep you alive you know yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i want tell you me, to tell me i'm some of the I'm things already tell me yeah no all i want you to do uh, this is already there's tons there for us to start to unpack i've been fascinated um the school teacher story and i think i think pretty much every single one of these types of um conversations i do with a whole range of really fascinating people from different different sectors I think probably about 95% of them have got a parallel story there about a teacher that inspired them or an educator or an artist in some way that there was that moment where it could have gone either way and it, it made all the difference. Or unfortunately, in some cases, they were so detrimental, it really took them away and it took them, you know, 20 years to sort of circle back. But it's always, I always find it fascinating when you see these parallel stories that, that pop up. Now, I wanted to really sort of roll back to the beginning with some of this because... I wanted to play devil's advocate a bit for the, for the benefit of maybe some of the people on the call and say, so you've, you know, you've got some of these architects, well, playing devil's advocate at the provocations. Well, well, Trevor, why do they need you? Don't all architects and designers, do they not all, um, these engineers, they already know how to draw and sketch. Why is it not? Why is it useful for them? Why do they need you? Why do they need someone to come in and, and help and, and show them about the value of drawing? Surely they're graduating. <laughs> I know I'm being very provocative. Surely they're yeah, graduating and they're coming out with those, you know, these architects and engineers, they're graduating and they're coming out and they're all ready to go into the client meeting and be able to pick up a pencil and paper and sketch out a design, surely. Right. That was a bit over the top provocative, but you know what I'm saying. You would have thought so, wouldn't you? No. Um, so what's the value? That's, that's a, what, a multi-level question, so I'll see if I can just yeah. sort of... Um, first thing is that, yes, very often architects do and i i teach at uh, ucl and i teach at the aa so i do so i am a part of their education and i i do teach i do, do teach to tend to teach just drawing and they are superlatively talented they draw like angels and i love being around the vibe in the room when when we get everybody drawing it's just um it's fabulous and then they leave school and they start their jobs. And, um, you know, they'll quite often start at quite a low level. Yeah. In architecture, they used to be, um, they used to be the entry level into architecture. If you were a non-architect, like Sir John Soane was a son of a bricklayer and he started out as a linesman. I love that. Or yeah. They were, also, they were also known as drudges. So you were the lowest of the low when you go into the company, okay? You don't go in at an elevated pitch. So. Quite often that means that you will be, you will be um, endlessly making whatever, whatever it is in the office. You're making rhino models or CAD drawings because you will, you will also have been educated to, trained up to a really high standard of, um, of um, you know, with computer graphics packages. Mm. So gradually it just wears away and wears away and wears away until the actual sketching thing especially in the current climate where of optimized, you know, everything is done super rapid. And um, it's the perception is that it will take too long to do drawings. But, um, but I think, um, I think what happens along the way is that you find the least, the line of least resistance. 
And because I teach drawing, I get all kinds of stories from the architects about, I just say to them, don't tell me that you don't draw anymore. You know, I don't like those lapsed Catholic stories. I don't like yeah, those stories. <laughs> draw anymore. Yeah, the, the yeah, to... <laughs> so, um, so what happens is they don't bore me with those. But what we do is we get, we get to a position where I say, if you want to draw, that's what I'm in the office to do. And, we, and we're going to run some drawing workshops and you're going to love them. So just come. Yeah. And what happens is, what quite often happens is, if there is a raison d'etre on the part of the office, like they, they are saying, we have all of this sort of, we have all of these debates and no, nobody's, you know, and people are too afraid to pick up a pen. And where we used to all sit around and draw on the same drawing, we don't do that anymore. And well, it's just the culture of, it's just the culture of, um, of the screen, you know, it's just monoculture of computer. Well, I was going to so say, they, there's something there, isn't there, about the elegance and speed. I mean, I, and I'm not, I'm all for digital as well. I mean, I, for me, it's not one or the other. It, it's both. But it's, it's choosing your tools and the places and all the rest of it. So, but there's something I, I, and I hear this a lot from quite senior architects who often say in confidence, they say that they find that the, the, the graduates that are sort of coming through the pipeline, um, they would like to have more drawing skills before they yeah. sort of get to that point. And, you know, they'll be in a situation where they'll just, you know, it's anecdotal. I'm just repeating what I've been told, but they'll say, okay, we, we've got a client coming in and I want you to just literally go and sit down 10 minutes, you know, here you are, pen and pencil, just, just quickly, just go and scribble down a few ideas. And I'm a bit like, what? Yeah. And they're like, it's just, just go and scribble down your ideas. It's like, well, where's the, Where's the iPad? Where's the Procreate? Where's the pen? Where's the CAD? And, mm. and I, no, I don't want that. We just want a sketch, just initial thoughts, or maybe just some, the beginning of a sketch that might show the development or the direction of travel of your thinking. Yeah. And, and that they, you know, I've been sort of people say, well, you know, that they're not necessarily quite there. And of course, they need a bit more. And I can only imagine from my own experience of being in all sorts of creative meetings that if you're an engineer or not, if there's a client, before you wait, before you get to any of those stages further down the line, you're going to need to have something that you can share presumably with, I suppose, um, engineers, the design team, maybe a surveyor, you know, all these different aspects, different roles. Sure. Before you even get to the next stage for the client to see, so you're not going down one avenue and then they go, oh, no, we hate that. Sure. So it's... I it, think um, that's I think that's a good summary, Kate. And um, Within the culture of the office, people normally get, get us in with the drawing gym program because the guys have corpsed. They have these skills, but, but because of the nature of suppressed motivation of the computer day in, day out, because it can just do things so quickly, yeah. um, then it just, it just atrophies through underuse. So when we do the drawing gym, it's usually four two-hour sessions. And people are all pumped again at the end of it. I mean, we have, you know, we have full attendance of these groups and, and, and we get to a point where all I say to them is, I'm not here to teach you a thing. There isn't a thing I can teach you. I'm here to remind you how much you love drawing. And that's, that's my that's, open... That's it, isn't it? You're, yeah, what they, is already there, you're just bringing it back to the surface. There's yeah. a very interesting comment in that, which I think is, is relevant, um, from Mar Margot Ward. I have always loved drawing. It needs to be made more important in schools. Totally agree with you, Margot. Um, architects used to be taught drawing, but they let the computer take over. So there's a bit of a problem. That's true, that's true Margot. To to that. um, some agree, but they are they are still taught drawings. But I mean, if I if I work in the school, then in the architecture school, then they certainly are taught drawing. Um, and um, it's just that uh, you know financial demands and and demands of speed of execution and stuff so so there's the what i want to also do maybe is to just debunk the notion that um all architecture proceeds from the famous sketch on the back of the envelope in a posh italian restaurant that isn't that is absolute that is a total crock of shit <laughs> i mean it just it just doesn't work like that now i, I I'm not suggesting that that doesn't ever happen, but what is more likely to happen is that, yes, there might be a back of an envelope, um, but it would be much more likely where an architect is trying to describe a detail to an engineer, yeah. and that's when they will sketch, and most architects sketch. So this is what I'm saying is they don't do the beautiful 
Ecole de Beaux-Arts sketches because there's no need for that. You would, it's like saying, um, you know, I, why would I want to use a plow when I can dig my 115-acre allotment? You know, why would I want to use... Well, it's obvious why you would want to use a plow or a rotavator because it, there, is no, there is no virtue in plugging away with a freehand drawing. When this can do it so much quicker, it can draw to scale. It can manifest your ideas so much quicker. But, but what you'll find is that at all stages, I, I heard a great description from, um, I think it was Rambo, one of the directors at Rambo. I'd given a talk in the office. And he said, in this office, we don't, we don't stop drawing until the design jelly has stopped wobbling. I thought that was a beautiful description. That is so good. You know, and the other thing is that what people, I think, maybe who are not in the built environment, don't appreciate is that drawing does take place right throughout the whole of the design um, process, but we never see any of it because it's not, they're not, they have a shelf life of about 20 minutes, these drawings, because somebody else comes up with something else and you have to change. So the, yeah. the drawing stages are all incremental and they are absolutely essential. This is something that um, I know every, everybody is talking about, you know, neuroscience and the relationship between drawing and retrieval. Yes. Okay. So there's, and uh, I'm no exception to that because it, there's been an explosion of um, knowledge around the way that the brain works and its relationship to drawing is becoming increasingly, I'm, I think one is becoming increasingly lucid about what is actually going on in people's brains when they draw. But, but, but just on this one tiny, tiny fragment, there is a, there is a neuroscientist uh, at UCL called Sam Gilbert, who I started a, a, a correspondence with. I teach at UCL in the engineering department, and he's, he's a neuroscientist there. And I just wrote to him one day, and I said, um, I said, I want to do some, uh, let me tell you the, let me tell you a micro story first, which is, you may find it funny, you might be offended by it. If I can offend people, I usually, <laughs> I usually do. So, me. Um, so this was, um, I have a friend who runs a very, very meteorically successful consultancy firm in the US. And I told him that I was really into neuroscience and the way that the brain's working, what, what we do when we draw. And I said, but I just don't have the time to research it. And he said, oh, what you need is a PhD. Wait, what's one of the, and then as the words were leaving my lips, I thought, that's exactly what I need. I didn't need, I didn't need. And so, so I contacted this is, uh, I don't know if I can take this through to its conclusion, but I'll, I'll try. <laughs> try to protect the names of the innocent. But the, the, the um, so what I did, what I wanted to do was, I wanted to pay a PhD to do some research for me, okay? Because they would be, they just know, obviously they have a carpet of knowledge that I was interested in taking tiny fragments from. Yeah. And so I contacted Sam, who was the, the, the doctor in charge of all of the PhDs, um, I think, I can't remember what his role is now, but so I said, basically, this is what I'm interested Sam, in, Sam, and I wrote two or three paragraphs. And I found, I found the writing of the paragraphs was so um, cathartic because I thought this is a language that I, I really want to know. So I wrote to him and I sent this off to him expecting, it was the, I was expecting, you know, to get the, to get an email back saying, I'm on my summer vacation, I'll be back in you know, 2026, whatever those standard emails are. And to my utter amazement and delight, he, he returned the email himself and said, this sounds really interesting. I'd like to work with you on this. And I, I just, it, was, it was just one of those moments where a light went on for me because I yeah. thought this is, this, this, this is, if you like, the intellectual correlation between the physical and um and physiological aspect of drawing this is this is the bit that you can actually take away with you and carry around with you so he gave me lots and lots of ways of looking at this but i'm i'm going to read something out that sam sent me if i may please do um, yeah. because um because it because they were always conversational um they didn't go into some highfalutin yeah you know, which often um, happens because Inaccessible. So, yeah. Have a listen to this. What we were talking about was when 
we've had this conversation, um, Kate, about people like Oliver Cavaglioli and um, dual coding and stuff. And, um, yeah. and this was the basis for this. And what, what, what he was describing to me is, you know, when, you, when you're, on a, you're, on a, you're on a tube train, you've got four stops. What can you draw? So you get out your sketchbook and you, you're uncomfortable until you see something, you see somebody, you see three people and two of them are asleep. One of them has a mustache and um, one of them has the most amazing leopard skin boots. You, you have to draw it in three stops on the train. So you get it out and you draw. Now, you sort of, you feel a sense of discomfort in your head when you see the drawing that you want to make, right? Now that thing is usually what I was describing to Sam and he, he, he's been describing this as cognitive offloading. It's where it's too much in your head. So you have to grab a piece of paper to draw it, okay? So this is, I'm gonna give you two examples of what Sam said to me, which have been really, um, which have given me a great deal of food for thought and which make me like very, very, um, um, I'm, I'm very uh, grateful to him for putting me on this path because I, I can, I have a very clear vocabulary now, especially with engineers, to describe what, why they should be drawing. So anyway, have a listen. Uh, we were talking about cavemen, uh, or cave people, and what were, the, what were the things that they did? They, um, they had to find food, they had to procreate, uh, they had to not be eaten, and they had to draw on walls. Oh yeah, uh, let me see if I got that right. You know, you know, those things are so essential. And then, oh, and they had to, you know, they had to paint on their caves. That wasn't some sort of Laura Ashley impulse that they had. That was something that they had, which was absolutely to do with processing their growth of knowledge. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that's what we were thinking is about storing information. So here we go. Um, Sam told me that um, the cave paintings tell us that they were, very, very sensitive to things that moved. So if you're living in a cave and you might have a torch, if anything moved, you had to know about it and you had to be able to spot it and sense it, right? Mm. Or else, because potentially it would kill you. For sure, yeah. So they started, we started to build up this incredibly highly evolved spatial and cognitive matrix in our head. And this, um, but, we don't have a very good memory for storing information, right? I, I can tell you five things on the trot. After five minutes, you might retain three of them. If I ask you tomorrow, two, you know, whatever it is. So what Sam explained to me was that, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna quote Sam because I'll make, a, I'll make a dog's dinner of it. So our abilities for creative thinking and for storing information in our working memory are very poor. So we've yeah. got short-term memory, working memory, and long-term memory. Working memory is consciousness, basically. So uh, storing information is very poor in our working memory. But in processing, navigating, and understanding space, our abilities are extremely good because we have highly evolved spatial cognitive skills, as described by, you know, not being eaten by something because it yeah. moved. The best robots still lack the ability of a three-year-old to interact with space. So... What we are very good at is the ability to interact and navigate through space. But we are poor at holding and accurately remembering information in working memory, in thinking logically through concepts. What evolution has solved for us is the ability to interact and navigate through space. And when we are sketching or diagram making, in a way, we are using what our brain is good at as a way of helping it to do something it's something that is poor at which is to organize concept. So when, when we make a diagram, we're leaning into our ability to make spatial cognitive um, value judgments as a way of solving. And you know, when you make a bubble diagram, that's what you're doing, you're using a spatial, a spatial thing to remember stuff. So you arrange information in a hierarchy. And that's exactly what you do when you draw. When an engineer draws, they have to take massively complex situations and turn them into simple um, diagrams. And that's where, that's where the drawing gym is superlatively helpful for them because I've been, the drawing gym for engineers and for architects is kind of four years in 
four years percolating, percolating away and me trying stuff out with engineers and you know you it's been it, don't you yeah to some degree but okay. there's there's one little thing before i i go off uh, neuroscience um and that is to do with transactive memory transactive memory operates where there's a group of people okay and in a in an engineering office for example you don't have to know everything because you store information in other people. And when you sit down and you make a drawing with somebody, you are telling somebody what you know, and you're inviting them to contribute the thing that you don't know to the drawing. So if a structural engineer sends a drawing over to a mechanical engineer, they've got two entirely different orientations and, and two entirely different reasons for making a drawing. And it's almost always to do, fight, to do with fighting about space. Because, the, you know, a mechanical engineer will say, hey, yeah, that's a great building. Yeah, fantastic. It looks really great. Where are you going to put all the conduit? And where are you going to, yeah. you know, send, where, like, oh, remind oh, me now. Yeah, yeah. So, where, so, so, so do you want some central heating or not? You know, it's <laughs> yeah. like, it's yeah. that kind of thing. So, so there's always like that fight over that. If you see in my studio, there's a eye beam going across there. You'll see that that's like, that's like hallowed space for, it's like the space that you absolutely always have to factor in. Um, anyway, anyway. So, um, so that's it on neuroscience, but I'm, uh, I'm, if, well, if anybody to, wants. Yeah, I wanted to pick up on some of the stuff you were talking about. I, I do think it's fascinating. I, I think there'll probably, there'll be some people that might have some, some questions as, as we sort of uh, progress. I mean, I mean, some of the phrases that you use there, I mean, I love this phrase, cognitive offloading. I mean, that yeah. is absolutely what I do when I, I mean, there's different types of drawing, isn't there? There's the sort of the drawing in the zone where I'm just drawing something just to sort of get in the zone and calm down and use it for sort of a, oh, calm down. And then there's a, oh my God, my brain is too full of so many things. It's whirling around. I'm spinning too many plates. I just need to just, uh, and that's what I'm doing when I'm doing that. And I'm sketching out diagrams and charts and thoughts and drawings and, it is exactly doing that. And I and and that idea you were talking about with um, you know, the the the, the transactive memory with, with other individuals and how you share that, I think that's in, incredibly powerful as well. I mean I think I think what I'm trying to say is I think that there's a there's almost a a, a, a thinking that maybe we all think that we have got these I know we have these amazing enormous brains, but we're also that we they work in the same way as as our computer or our laptop and they don't they work very differently and we remember yeah. things differently and we store things in a different way and there are yeah. different strengths and weaknesses to both and so i think trying to sort of almost pretend and keep up in a way with the way that computers think and, I'm, and, I'm, and obviously they're, they're leaps ahead in some way you re reference the three-year-old robot in some ways there's they'll never be able to or maybe they will i don't know but it's there's, there's a bit of, a, I think there's a tension there for me because I think about my children, I think about, I'm constantly trying to get them off social media and I think about the, the lack of attention that, uh, there's been a really, some really interesting articles written about how it, uh, children, but not even just kids, adults as well, their attentive span has gone way down. Children oh, yeah. are it very hard to just read to the end of a book or any, an article, yeah. anything now. Be, and it's partly because it's this, 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 this all the time and the pace of, the way that you scroll, the pace of that they found that even the, the speed that you scroll down on something on tickets, we're starting to get rewired, and our brains are not are not made in, in that way. We think we remember differently, and I'm quite interested in unpacking all of that really. So for so long at the big draw, it's been a lot about the embodiment of drawing and the haptic, and I love all of that. But I think I'm becoming increasingly interested in much more of the physiological side and neurological side and, and physically what changes are happening in our brain, what's lighting up when we're doing these things, um, yeah. when we're drawing and different types of drawing as well. And I wonder if we yeah, can yeah. unpack some of that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, once again, that's quite a, quite a complex question, but there, um, uh, yeah, people are putting up things about mind maps and stuff and you, j just to um, engage with your points, Kate, um, we, we um, I mentioned, I mentioned cave people, but if you, um, 
if you know if you're familiar with the book uh, *Sapiens*, um, then there it's a it's a tour de force really about our how our evolution. Um, but we are um, our brains are we are when we try to understand working with computers and um, phones and screens, we're working with an evolutionarily outmoded. So we are we are evolutionarily outmoded, but we're not equal to process this amount of information. And I think when we talk about the way that computers think, they don't think; they produce information, but we mistake it for thinking. And we we try to process it. Um, and um, so many studies now have been produced about not multitasking, about just the the importance of deep work. You know, one by Cal, whatever his name is, the guru of deep work, and yeah. practically everything I, practically everything I subscribe to now is not is doing things without multitasking. Is just doing something because uh, because we have an attentional filter, and as soon as you switch from one thing to another, that's when your attentional filter gets drained. Yeah. We only have so much oxygen per day in our brain, and when you start to get, you know. Um, when you start to wobble around because you can't decide which way is up anymore, it's time to, it's just time to, to let go. And we, but we, we are, we are, we are bombarded. We are, we are sort of information obese and we, we, we have to start to make decisions about what we're going to switch off. Mm. I mean, I mean, this is, um, I think it's such an interesting concept. I mean, it's almost like society dictates that it's it's sort of the opposite isn't it it's just like um how much can you squeeze into the day how many spates how many pates can you spin you know oh can't you multitask i can i can do 10 at the same time you know it's that sort of bang bang and you know if you're just sort of on one thing it's almost like oh oh my god i'm not maximizing my time i need to maximize my time and i i'm, I'm incredibly guilty of doing that just like oh my god i haven't got time to, i need to maximize i have to leverage i have and I, th I think it, it. I think it is incredibly draining on on our brains. Um, well, that's I, I it's do, it is. I think the rest. If if anybody is, um, I mean, I've done a fair amount of reading around this, and um, this is. I've just got this book, which I thought I would plug for no reason, but it's Daniel Levitin, The Organized Mind, and that's. This is. Um, I found this to be. If anybody wants to do a screenshot of that, it's Daniel Levitin, The Organized Mind. I found him to be immensely satisfying to read and also he's inc incredibly learned i mean he's um everything he does is absolutely evidence-based based on his practice mm -hmm. but he's interesting because he's also he's got an amazing background he you know among other things sort of hung out with talking heads and david david bowie and he's oh, wow. absolutely fascinated he's he put a book out i think the book may be called the brain on music or something like that as you oh, know yeah. suggesting that you know the brain on acid or the brain on cannabis whatever it is it's it's like that idea that this is what your brain does with music and this is why you respond to it this way yeah. and i think um he he just he just takes this he just strips the whole concept down and says basically um you have to give you have to just step back from this information tsunami and you have to also think that because you know, um, people on American TV soaps get into these fixes with, uh, you know, with um, with multitasking and they're supermen and superwomen. It's a crock. It's an, it's another crock. And you and you have to absolutely put your foot down in your own life and say, actually, I'm not going to fall for that because I get home on a night and I feel like I've just been in a bloody war. I've been in a war zone and I. You know, you just have to kind of go, okay, enough already. You have to turn your, but you have to, first of all, don't buy any newspapers anymore. That's the that's okay. first thing I would recommend. <laughs> because I the media, a, has, the media. Sorry, in the book, sorry to interrupt. I was going to just, before I um, I'll lose him again, I just found him on my emails. I was on a thing for um, Arts for Dementia, which is a wonderful right. art charity that, that explores um, drawing obviously sketching for pre-diagnosis for, for people who are perhaps heading towards dementia as a way to 
pull it back and help them regain some of their a little bit more of their control and one of the speakers and I'm, i just found his name on my emails he was he was really interesting and it just reminds me so much he was he's called samia zeki and he is a british french neurobiologist and he's yes, i know the name i'm familiar you with know the name him? yeah and he studies in um studying a primate visual brain and the neural correlations um particularly around love desire and beauty generative sensory inputs but so it's neuro aesthetics but Gosh, is he actually blind? blind? If you didn't look at on the screen. Anyway, but he was talking a bit about the pleasure principle, but this idea that people get pleasure and bits of the lane of the brain light up and they get pleasure if they experience something, they find beauty in it for whatever reason that might be and pleasure in it. And then they, there's, there's a, a usefulness to it and then there's a completion. So it feels like there's something useful that has come from. Yeah. It's actually it's very useful, beautiful William Morris. But anyway... And, and bits of your, leg, your brain light up. And I just thought this is a really, really interesting um, that there are particular parts of the brain that directly correlate. And I wonder how this fits with the sense of, of drawing because there's so many different things with drawing. There is a sense of usefulness. There's a beginning and an end to it. There's yeah. the haptic, there's the immersive. You could say there's a certain element of elegance and beauty to it. Just found it so interesting. Um, it, it's a fascinating area of, of, of yeah, study. Yeah. It is. I mean, the pleasure that people get from drawing is it shouldn't be underestimated because it's quite often um, it's quite often the incentive to pick up a pencil is that, you know, some at some point you're going to be, you know, you're going to enjoy this. Yeah. I mean, there's enjoyment. There are different aspects of enjoyment. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm from <laughs> when I when I was in art school um, decades ago. You there was only one thing that there was there was there was like um, it was always to do with the hard one image, right? It was always to do with the hard one image. Like, there's no point starting a drawing unless you've got the whole day to work on it. And uh, you have to draw until you think you're gonna burst. You know, that was the, that was the ethos in art school then. So, so the 10,000 hour theory was absolutely lived out by art schools and art students at that time. That's what you did, you just drew until you, yeah. until you were really, really miserable. And then you came in and tried <laughs> Tomorrow, you know, you go down the pub with the other students and you sit there in a daze, just stare at your paint for hours on end and just wonder where it all went wrong. Mm. And you just kind of <laughs> go in the next day and then you'd experience this extraordinary joy, you know, and elation. And uh, that, it's like this, like a sine wave when you draw it. it I mean, if you, it's not, it's not always to do with the pleasure or if you like that pleasure is derived from different things. Pre pleasure, the pleasure is de derived relative to the difficulty of the task you set yourself, I think. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I was going to say was before, um, before I end the interview was to recommend the people, if, the, if people don't know about the drawing gym, which is the... Um, it's a free it's a free resource that um you should check out it's drawinggym.co.uk and we have um an instagram page uh an instagram account so if you want to do some drawing um the drawing gym is a free there is a free foundation if you like so all you, you, you literally go there you register and you get access to about um like maybe 15 or 20 hours of, of of short exercises small exercises and the whole thing i think kate one of the things that we talked about prior to the interview was to do with moving moving taking taking drawing methods and techniques and ideas from one discipline and transplanting them yeah so that people who aren't specialists can get access to though that to that way of drawing and um this is this is actually the, if you look on the screen now, guys, this is Vasu, who's our studio manager, and she's just stuck the address on. So that's drawinggym.co.uk forward slash foundation, and that will get you to the foundation. So, oh, yeah, so give that a go. And what happens is there's also an opportunity to scan your drawings and upload them, which means that, and what we do is we, we regularly look through the drawings that are uploaded, and we have a good examples um, selection. So we put those in so that, when you do your drawing, you can make your own drawings and you, you will refer to some of the instruction. All, most of the instruction is in very short films, like three minute films. 
then there are underlays and things you can print out. It's a, you know, it's a, it's our free thing. And it's, it's, it's initially- wonderful. It's wonderful, it's very detailed, it's very extensive, it's accessible. You're talking about language earlier. And often some of these things, they get a little bit lost and steeped and you sort of think, oh, is that for me? Uh, but you can go into this and really throw yourself into it. It's very accessible. Well, it's also something that if you've got half an hour, you can just log yeah. in and just draw in. So these are, these are things that initially are for built environment professionals, but they migrate. So everybody wants to learn how to draw perspective and there's some, some little perspective things in there and there's um, things to do with you know, drawing freehand, making, making neat freehand drawings, how to use line weight, how to communicate a, hierarchy, a visual hierarchy. They're all, they're all kind of in there. And, and um, we'd be delighted if people started to use it. We've got about, I think, I mean, Vasu will probably know this better than I, but um, we've probably got in maybe maybe over 2,000 people that, that yeah. use it or have it or something. I don't know. And just for anyway. people call, Vasu, you work together, don't you? Vasu is your colleague at the drawing gym. Vasu, uh, Vasu is the drawing at work studio manager. And um, she um, kicks my ass regularly. I and the call. Make sure I do everything I'm supposed to do. So, <laughs> there's a couple of questions I can see in the in the chat, Trevor. We're fine. We've got about another 10, 15 minutes, if that's all right. Okay. Sure, sure. Um, well, you know, it's up to you, really. How long you want do you want to chat? So we've got we've got Asa Asa has said, "Do you think that drawing can help understanding, e.g., with school children learn physics concepts?" I would say absolutely. But Trevor, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, there, there are certainly, I mean, in terms of maths and physics and engineering, for example, um, there is a whole branch of engineering drawing called engineering graphics. And it's where you take numerical things and you put them into a diagram. So if you want to build a bridge, you can, you can figure out, you know, what the loads will be on a bridge and you, you can diagram it in such a way. But I have mentioned that, um, I have mentioned about uh, Oliver Cavaglioli, and I would, I, I would just point at him because he's the expert. Um, let me just see if I can find a book. I can. While you're getting the book, Trevor, for Asa Asa Taylor be on on the call. Um, if you look on our on the Big Draws YouTube account, you'll fi you'll also find a couple, but there's one in particular that's very good. One of our long-standing patrons is uh, Sir Roger Penrose, who is yeah. also a very very famous um, physicist yeah. mathematician. And he talks incredibly powerfully and very beautifully about the power of drawing in mathematics and physics. And there's in the video, there's some very beautiful sketchbooks of his. And it's, they're so lovely because as he's going through the sketchbooks, they're interchangeable between his sketching and drawings, sort of merging into algorithms and into design yeah. and then back to maths and back into pure and physics. Oh, it's fascinating. Um, and he's fascinated with geometry and talks about the, the beauty of geometry for maths and physics and line, it, it, incredibly inspiring, but there, there are some wonderful videos. And he talks about it um, quite a bit in other videos online. And he recently was involved, he won some, I think he won a really, not, it wasn't the Nobel Prize. It was a, a very significant prize and it was around um, the, how he was using drawing one of his latest discoveries into space. So yeah. very impressive. Well, this is um. This you got the book. book um, this is dual coding, dual coding with teachers, um, and that's Oliver Cavaglioli, and uh, I really do recommend it if it's um, if it's uh, if it's to do with um, taking really abstract ethereal concepts and making them tangible, turning them into a physical drawing, is a great way to do that. So, uh, I I first met Oliver because he came to the drawing gym he came to uh, he came actually twice to the course and he did two separate courses and then he wrote to me and asked um uh would the drawing gym and the big draw do a sketch mob in Birmingham city center at all <laughs> that's from Rob hello Rob um it's always tempting um and we are we are going to be doing a big one with we're, we're planning and it's in its infancy so don't quote me on this but um but Bureau we're Apple a few different things but um we can we can put some um maybe some links in the chat or and if people want to get in touch about more broader 
things at the big draw so we can do that at the end i'm just picking up some of the other, other things in the comments just before we get to the more recent one so we've got we've got willie here the architect sketchbook so jill kitner who is a professional downhill mountain biker draws mind maps of the courses she rides she comes from a graphic design background. I love that. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Roll down. See what else people have written in. I think there was something else. So we've got Dav Davsum. This is great. Do more. Love it. Drawing helps us organize and make sense of our thinking. Totally agree with you. And then, yeah, then we've got to the ones you were just saying. So is that Rob talking about the drawing gym, a big draw gym, a sketch more than Birmingham? Yeah. Um, yeah. Rob yeah, is, so we uh, regularly do our own sketch crawls. Is it is it Rob? So the big drawing runs lots of sketch crawls, but and we are talking to Trevor about about possibly doing some collaboration. So watch this space, or if you want to just get in touch with the team at the big draw, all the details are on on the website. Yeah, I mean the big draw man, that you've come to the right place. That's what the big draw do. I mean, we used to do huge events, right? We we used to. I used to bring along kind of fifteen or twenty architects that were special, you know, um, expert sketch. And we'd, we'd, we'd show up with uh, 75 drawing boards and uh, we'd, we'd put all the paper on and, and we'd have these great big crowds of people. Narinda, was, Narinda would be there, you know, Narinda would be at yeah. one end of a building and we'd be at the other end. And, um, and it's fantastic. I'm just, I'm just going to show you this, which is May. Um, this is um, kind of the, the whole thing to do with cognitive offloading is when, is if you, for me, I use it extensive, I use sketchbooks extensively when I teach. And um, this is one such thing. So, so this is, um, this is like eight o'clock in the morning and I'm in, I'm in a cafe and I'm teaching the AA Foundation, Architectural Association. And we're talking about taxonomy, which is a kind of hierarchy of concepts. There's my bubble diagram. And then we're going to turn those bubble diagrams into little drawings. And then we're going to make the drawings into one larger drawing because it's about a journey. Oh, look at that aeroplane. Oh, that is so nice. Yep. Yeah. And that's my, that's my yeah, journey. I can, totally, from... I can totally relate to all of that. Yeah, totally relate that's, to that. That's, and that's I, bet you remember do... the, I bet you remember every detail. Of it. It's like the whole thing is so immersive. It is like an imprint of that time of what you were doing, what you were thinking. You don't have written yeah. words. It's just the whole, it's so visual. It's, it, it goes right back to that, how you remember what you remember. And it just accesses it and pulls it all out in the most visual way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's really critical. That Because if something is going to happen over a, a period of time, you need to sequence it, right? You can't just go in and blurt out the whole game plan. You, you, yeah. have, you have to. You, you have to just introduce a little bit at a time so people don't feel overwhelmed with a task. Yeah, I can, I always remember when I, I mean, I must have been about 11 or 12, I started secondary school. And I remember in my English and history lessons, you know, you get the, you get the written question about, you know, I don't know, Henry VIII or whatever. And I'd be like, oh, I want, I know it's sort of there, but I, and I'd want to, I'd want to pick up a pen, I'd want pencil and paper and I would want to draw out my answer and my response and map it out because I just found it so difficult to really jump in. I sort of knew it was there, but I wasn't quite accessing it and I needed to be able to visualize it, what it looked like, what the different segments are there, what the different components were, you know, all the different, the intro, how it was, but I needed to draw it and we weren't allowed, we weren't allowed to sketch anything. It was like scribbling and do we weren't allowed yeah. to, and it, yeah. well, to this day it frustrates me. I just think, why wouldn't, why, why couldn't I have just, it wouldn't have hurt anyone. But yeah. It's, it's, it's a memory aid, isn't it? A memory aid. I, 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 I do the same if I go into a um, bureau, um, not Bureau of Apple, uh, Arab used to run some fantastic um, breakfast with Arab, they used to be called, and they'd have some brilliant engineer, some Arab guy sh show up to tell you about what they were doing with the, you know, with the, um, with some really remote building in Spain that they were stopping from falling over. And he, and I would just be blissed out because I could just drop in the second I went in because this screen was full of amazing, you know, yeah. full of ama amazing images. And I'm, I would just go to, I'd go for the breakfast and I'd go to draw and to hang out with other engineers and stuff. You know, it was, oh, they were, yeah. great. It was so, it's such a highly evolved idea to have people meeting on a morning to discuss things and it sets you up for the day, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it puts the bar really high.
And it yeah, puts it all, of stuff, all of this stuff to do with the inundation of information that you're going to be hit with throughout the day. It just helps to level you and go, no, thanks. I'm just going to do one thing really well today. I'm going to, I'm going to tell everyone, I'm, just, I'm not going to answer any emails. I'm just going oh, to do. Oh, I love that. I wish I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen. There's a lovely Okay, you've got, you've got my place to do it. You must okay. hear. You must hear, Trevor. So this is Dav Davson. Our staff at Made in Mayflower and pupils have worked through your drawing gym modules, the primary pupils and their families too. Thank you for sharing wow. your wisdom with That is amazing. Wow. Can I just ask clarification because the drawing gym is also a free thing that I've set up for UCL engineers. Could you clarify, is it, is it the drawing gym foundation then, the free foundation or is it the UCL drawing gym? So I think he's or she's still on the call. Let's see if they come back. Yeah, see if they come back. But what a lovely well, endorsement. That's, that's, that's exactly what we set it up for. If, if it's intergenerational, then that's that's even better still. That's an amazing thing. I, I think, I mean, so, it, yeah, we'd love you to hear more from that, that individual on that. I mean, that's something that I think we would love to hear more from at the um, as well, to share that story. Dav, Dav, Sam. Dav, Dav, Sam. Um, Let me just write that well, down. Um, we need to, I need, I need to know what you've done and uh, how you're using it. This is music. I mean, I, I'm and so... Foundation, yes. Foundation, yes. So, well, um... Find out more from you, I think, on that, so we can maybe share your, what you've yeah, done. Yeah, I'd love Very to, um, I'd love, I'd love to see what you've done. Um, so if you can, Dab Dab Sam, can you give us at least one name from the group? Uh, because... We can look online and th we see every single drawing that's completed and uploaded. As long as you've uploaded them, I can see what your responses were. So can you encourage, can you encourage somebody to scan them and upload them? There's, you know that on the foundation, there's also a tutorial from, a, a micro tutorial from Vasu about how to scan a drawing with your phone. If you look at, if you can get people to scan and upload, that would be amazing. But I'd love to hear. I'd absolutely love to hear more. So do get in touch. Um, and I mean, to get in touch, your your details will be on the the drawing gym website. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, you can just uh, send it into Drawing at Work, uh, onto info at Drawing at Work, and I'll, I'll oh, get it. Oh, uh, thank you, Vasu. Vasu, you just put it in. Just put your email in the That's in the chat. Email. So, fantastic. So, so do send over. I'd love I'd love to hear. I'm always interested to see to see how people use it because it helps us. I mean, the, 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 um, the foundation course is a work in progress repeatedly. It's, it's never going to be complete because we, we keep tweaking and taking stuff down and putting new stuff up. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's responsive. You know, whatever we see is popular, we, we, we keep. And if some things are obscure and people are not using, then yeah. we take them down. Yeah. So, so I'm delighted. So Does anybody I mean, have any questions? Yeah, was there any more questions? But, I mean, I also wanted to... Obviously, I want to sort of thank you, Trevor and Eva, and I want to ask you a bit more about what next for you, what would be your, your next big thing. But before that, does anybody else who's still on the chat have anything they would like to ask our special guest? Anything else? I mean, Trevor, my, my, I suppose my question was, for, for people on the call, and obviously just to reiterate again that this will stay with us. So when we get to the end of this, this as a recording, this will stay on the big draws uh, video channel on Instagram yeah. and what Great. we'll then do is we will um, download it and then upload it to our YouTube account but we'll obviously also be able to share that uh, file with Trevor and Basu and the team over at the drawing gym so that you'll be able to share that as well so people who have missed it will be able to watch it so for anyone on the call if you think your friends or colleagues would enjoy finding out more about all of this please do share that link with us make sure you're following both the big draw and, and the drawing gym drawing at work but yeah the question was trevor if pe people on the call want to get involved now is the best way for them to get involved is through the foundation the free oh foundation. totally always yeah. always so that's really where because, you'd like to be signposting people yeah i'm not i'm not i'm not going to be disrespectful here but um people talk a good game they say, oh yeah, I really want to get involved in drawing. And, and I, I just say, you know, put up or shut up. If you go to the site, do some drawing, scan it, upload it, then we've got a conversation. But 
until that time, you know, you, you know what I mean? You I'm, I'm just, life's too short. <laughs> Don't tell me you're going to do it and then not do it. I'm not. I'm not some sort of confessor here. You know, I'm not. It's not evangelism. You don't. You don't have to do it. You know, do it if you want to do it. Yeah. But just. You know. uh, so you've here's got, something. You've got we've a big fan here. Yeah, we love the instruction on how to draw simple straight lines. We've taught our pupils this. Joanne Lord, Ross Wilcox. Oh, those are all the names. All taken the foundation. Amazing. Right. Basu's just put all the short courses for the public advertised Instagram as well. So it sounds like yeah. the best place generally is, is through the foundation. But also yeah. my understanding would be, Trevor, that if there are any large corporates or engineering firms or architectural practices, etc., on the call yeah. who are interested in perhaps getting involved with the other aspects of your work, which I know is slightly different from the foundation, then they can also yeah, get yeah. in touch with you and Basu, can't they? I think I think also the other thing that I should mention is that we have you know we've been around some time so we do we have amazing partnerships yeah so for example in two I think two or three weeks uh, maybe four weeks I'm running the drawing gym for the Institution of Structural Engineers and I, I do that twice a year I do it for the engineering club so we work with large big big engineering firms but we also there's there's also a way that people can join a course like rob who mentioned about birmingham i know rob because he did the drawing gym he's an engineer and he did the drawing gym and then he he just said casually that he'd want to do some more drawing and that's that's when we were thinking well this is where we have to put up the sketchbook habit course because i mean we haven't even talked about sketchbooks tonight but sketchbooks no are, we could do a whole other session because i mean we know at the big draw that sketchbooks oh my goodness from a from a very very even just from a very cynical point of view if we put any sort of sketchbook architect sketchbook engineering artist sketchbook yeah. on any of our social media channels we know it's going to get a lot of hits it just does yeah. people love it i think it's nosing us they love they love this they love it on the video when people you go like that yeah zoom in on the it's they love it they love it they, people love looking at sketchbooks i think it's it's sort of there's something that you can interact with. Are not yeah, they're very unthreatening, aren't they? They just, yeah. they just. Um, I think that's it, and also get, shows the process, doesn't it? It's not just saying this has to be about the, the, some polished end product, which isn't real yeah. anyway. It's, it's, it's the, an honesty and authenticity about showing this is the thinking and this is the process, and I'm, I'm happy to share with you this unpolished thing, and I'm happry with that. There's something about I that. Think, very inviting. Yeah, um, when we were discussing this, you and I, when we had breakfast over South Ken wherever it was and I I said to you it's kind of dawning on me slowly I've got all these sketchbooks and it dawns on me that I only that I only tend to draw when I'm meant to be doing something else right yeah and I said you know we should have we should I should do a thing and we'll call it the procrastinator sketch oh yeah I do that if I, if no. I, I just think oh I can't be bothered to do this awful contract I'll just do a bit of drawing or I'll knit and I do find yeah. that similar that hat that hand to eye uh, it's quite similar. Yeah. It's, it's like, oh, I just do a bit of knitting or a bit of saying, oh, I just do a bit of drawing because I know I'm avoiding yeah. doing something that I have to do, you know. It, yeah, I know. It's, yeah, it's true. Um, oh, I love that on the yeah. cover. But someone's written, so, so sketchbooks are the beginning of everything. I love it. Yeah. yeah, that's very, that's very often the case. But, but what's, what's interesting is that because your mind is focused on something else rather than the thing you're doing, you quite often will put it, you, you will make one type of drawing in the sketchbook and you'll put the sketchbook away, you pick it up two weeks later and you open it on the very same page and you've got a very different drawing to the one you put away. Yeah. Because you've, your, your brain has gone through some it's been kind of process. Subconsciously, without you realise, it's been carrying on processing the challenge or the yeah. problem that you were worrying about before, it, without yeah. you thinking. And you come back to it and you think, oh, actually, yes, it has been you know, has been doing something, wearing away. Yeah, it's amazingly subtle, the relationship that one has with one's own drawings, especially because if you've given yourself a particular task in the drawing and you've missed it, you've missed it by a mile, but you've hit something else, that's also quite often where the evolution takes place. Yeah. It's a, it's a morphing, it's a shape-shifting of some concept, but it's quite often through those accidents that, um, that if, if, if you are prepared to shape shift also intellectually you, you go oh well it isn't a very good one of those drawings but it's quite a good one of these drawings yeah and um, context, you might 
you're there's, looking. there's many, many a story about people sketching, but um, uh, we were talking particularly about just quick scribbles, right? And um, there's a great story, which I, I know to be the truth because um, I've seen the drawings and I know the two people involved. Um, Ed McCann, who's the current, um, he's the current Supremo at the Institution of Civil Engineering. I don't know what the Supremo is called. Um, Ed Honcho. Ed, whatever it is. I'm, I'm so sorry if I'm disrespectful, Ed, but <laughs> any, any family listening. Um, he and Chris Wise, Chris Wise is a really amazing engineer, and they went to Stockton on Tees. They were going to design a footbridge, and um, they came back. And in the journey back from Stockton to King's Cross, Ed talked and Chris drew. And Chris drew and Ed talked and then they do, and, and so it was constantly, Chris was kind of going, is that what you mean? Is this what you mean? Is, you know what I mean? Yeah. So the earlier comment that somebody had made about teaching physics, this is absolutely on the money as an, as an example is where they were taking abstract concepts yeah. and they were putting them into quick diagrams. Now, the drawings that Chris did for that became manifest as it won the competition. So in that train journey, which I, I know quite well, it's like two and just under three hours, Chris did about 60 drawings, one after another after another. But he said to me that if you, you can't just sit down and engineer something like that, you have to respond to the last sketch that you made. And then you respond to the next sketch and you respond to that one. So it's that, it's that three-way thing, Ed, Chris, and the drawings. Yeah. And it's, um, that's that thing of transactive memory. You know, he's, he's, he's speculating and Ed is going, no, it's not that, it's this, or whatever it might be. But that's, but right. that's a true story. And I've, I've, um, I've seen uh, Chris's sketchbooks, and it's the absolute truth. And he has those kinds of conversations, you know, with Norman Foster. He sits down and he draws, and Norman draws, and they, you know, they have that high, those high power conversations with yeah. these infantile scribbles on a piece of paper. Yeah, 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 yeah. It reminds that's me of another story. So Ivan Harbour, who is another of our we we'll see um, Norman Foster and Narendra as well. But um, another one, Ivan Harbour is a, is, a, is a big draw page. And I remember a story of his that stuck with me. And it's really, it's building what you're saying, that idea of, I suppose, the, 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 that group memory, really. But also, for me, the democratisation, if you like, of, of drawing. So when you, he, he, was, he was talking about I don't, when somebody from one of his team, basically, and they were over on a big job. I think it was in France. And they didn't speak French or whatever it was. And there was a problem with, on the, actually, on the, with actually the builders. And so they had a situation where, and it was, it was quite, you know, it, it was what you were saying about an engineer is drawing. It's going to be very different. Or the different, different types of engineering drawing, you know, they're going to be focusing on, is there a duct? Is there a toilet in the right place? And the architect's going, oh, is it beautiful? Is it this? You know, all the different layering of people looking at different aspects of it. And for whatever, there was, and it came down to some quite simple, well, the, the bolts are not going to work. Well, that's not. It was something like that, and they just couldn't because yeah. they couldn't speak language. And they resorted to drawing sketches with yeah. the builders, with the builders, and because the builders knew what they were saying, what they wanted to say, and they could understand the drawings. And so that's how they did yeah. it. And I just thought, yeah, yeah. there you go. That just it just shows you it cuts across everything. The builders knew what they were trying to say, and it was the way that they were able to communicate across the the builders, the engineers, the architects, because they didn't. <laughs> someone that spoke the language well that was um the guy who did the drawings was was called um stuart i can't remember his surname he was a young he was a young graduate and he filled all these sketchbooks and the project was baracus airport uh -huh. and it was the, the award-winning uh, airport well well ivan told me uh, ivan I was in the I was in the old Rogers building, and Ivan came in one day, and we started talking. And we, we we he was talking about the reluctance of architects to pick up a pen, and he's we were we were talking, and they just won a major award, and he would just come back from the celebration to the office, so he was he was he was tingly, you know, he was like on he was on fire. He, he they just won this massive award, and he'd left the celebrations to come back for something. So he said, so we were talking about the, the concept sketches. Yeah. And he said, when, when we designed Baracus Airport, and Baracus Airport was the Sterling Prize winning airport, if, if people don't know what it is, it's in, in um, and he said, M my idea was that the airport should tell the story and it should be about the earth and air and, its re and the relationship between the two. And I, 
I sat there and I thought, mm, yeah, okay. And then he just, he picked up a pen and every, all of the surfaces in Rogers were, used to be washable. And about every three meters, there was a great big bucket full of colored pens. So the kids, all of the kids of the employees used to love going in there and they would, you know, they'd scribble all over the walls. They were all completely washable. <laughs> anyway, Ivan just went like this and he just went, he just sort of made a diagram. He sort of went like this. And he said, we, we wanted it to be something that was reminiscent of flight because it's an airport. And we wanted it to be really a highly evolved um, cir air circulatory system so that it would cool itself with the natural materials. And you, it's, a, it's an absolutely exquisite airport. And, um, and he just did these sections through it. And it took him maybe, you know, under a minute. But you were there. You were there with the concept. Uh, yeah. And it was just one of those moments which was so lucid. And it was such an embodiment. And, and as you said earlier, you know, the, the massive amount of detailing that has to go into the de design of any building. But you have to be able to keep referring back to that basic drawing and saying, have we deserted this principle? You know, let's, yeah, let's yeah. get rid of have it. We, yeah, have we just lost, gone way off brief? You know, do we need to, yeah. Yeah, there is a, there is a sort of Johnny Ive saying, the, the old product designer of Apple, um, who said, you get to simplicity by working through complexity, you don't get the simplicity by ignoring, mm -hmm. by ignoring complexity. You have to go through it and out the other side. And I think that's, I think that's what drawing does mm -hmm. through a synthesis, through refinement and through mm -hmm. sh shedding all the sort of superficial layers, you can get to a really core cool description of something. Yeah. yeah. Um, is everybody bored stiff and do they want to start well, on their I had Netflix? I a little note from um, the team saying, oh, look at the time, Kate. <laughs> so, we, don't we, we knew we'd do this, didn't we, Trevor? We knew that we'd be going on. I mean, I, I think we need to do another one about sketch or something. But, Does I'm anybody just, have any further questions? Yeah, any the, questions the, for the, Trevor before we wrap it up? We'll, we'll wrap it up. I mean, what I suppose what it's always good to end on is for anybody on, on the call is, I mean, I'm sure many of you already draw, and there's sometimes, of course, Miss, Miss I drew this. Collaborational drawing is an amazing idea that works in the classroom. Absolutely. Yeah. Please check out the Big Draw website if you don't know what we do already. We, that's the essence of, of what we do, really. Hundreds of yeah, classes, yeah, yeah. thousands of schools over the years have, have taken part. But it's that whole thing about at the, at the end of this call, maybe tomorrow, maybe this week, pick up a pencil or a pen and do some drawing. Do some drawing, yeah. Do some drawing and share <laughs> your thoughts with us. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. So, so thanks, guys. Thanks for joining, and a uh, big thanks also, Basu, for helping enable this. Um, yeah. Once again. Thank you so much to both Trevor and Basu, who's there secretly behind the scenes. Um, but absolute pleasure as always, Trevor. You know I could talk to you. We do <laughs> when we meet up. We could talk about this all day, and I think we probably will need to do another follow-up session at some point. For yeah, anyone who's missed it, we'll on our so uh, people can. People can watch it again and share it. Yes. Someone's yeah. just said, please Good. another call. Yes, on sketchbooks. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna say I'm gonna say goodbye to everyone and uh, and wish you all well. And yeah, I mean, um, just keep drawing. You know, keep it's um, yeah, and a real pleasure as always. Well. Such a pleasure, Trevor, to talk to you. You're amazing. Absolutely. Okay. A real joy. So, and soon. Bye for now, everyone. All right, lovely. Thank you. Thank you to everybody that stayed with us.